Hello and welcome to the session on Association of Ideas. How does the mind work? David Hume, 1711 to 1776, claims that there are three types of regularity that hold between perceptions. While impressions merely exhibit these regularities, it is on the basis of these regularities that our ideas pass through our minds in the sequences that they do. The three regularities are, first one, resemblance, example, moving from an impression of a picture, example of a dog to the thought of the pictured object, the dog. Contiguity in time and space, example, moving from the thought of an event, the moon landing, to something else that happened at the same time. Third one, cause and effect, example, moving from the thought of a wound to thinking of pain. It may seem implausible that just these three relations govern all transitions of thought. Hume discusses this at greater length in the treatise, where he emphasizes that we must explore the full extent of the relations to see that they hold. Two apparently unconnected ideas will always, he claims, be linked by a third idea which is connected by a principle to both. He also develops the principle of cause and effect. For the ideas of A and B to be linked by this principle, it need not to be that A is the cause of B or vice versa. Rather, they simply need to be connected by causation. Example, I might think of a cousin and then of another relation. The two are casually linked by genetic ties without one being a cause or effect of the other. Again. The object of the first idea need not to be a cause of object of the second, but may only cause some action or movement in it, or need only have the power to do so. So we might move from the idea of a judge to that of a criminal. Hugh presents his theory as an empirical discovery. Are there any other regularities? We must look and see but he claims he cannot find any and that a consideration of literature and historical narratives support him. If we look at how these works are organized, we see that the events narrated form a kind of unity and to create this unity, others use the three types of connections listed. Hume intended this relation to hold between ideas in virtue of what they are about. But Sigmund Freud suggested that ideas could be connected through their emotional significance. Hence, one idea which is accompanied by a certain emotion might be followed by another accompanied by the same emotion and this is all the two ideas have in common. We can also make a more radical objection. Hume has not included logical relations among his principles, but surely trains of thought can and do follow logical inferences. Of course, this will involve resemblance, but we can urge that resemblance does not capture the real relation between the thoughts. The three principles are, according to Hume, natural functions of the mind. We do not intend to connect ideas in this way, this is just how the mind works. They are the foundation of thought. Without them, our ideas would remain isolated unconnected and we could not think about experience and reality at all. Hume ascribes a particularly important role to the principle of cause and effect. Finally, though he mentions it only briefly in the regularities also account for complex ideas and for the overlaps between concepts in different languages. Among the different languages, it is found that the words expressive of ideas, the most compounded do yet nearly correspond to each other. A certain proof that the simple ideas comprehended in the compound ones were bound together by some universal principle. The principles of association and the self. Hume argues that the self is nothing more than a bundle of thoughts and experiences. So what is it that ties a particular set of experiences into the particular bundle that constitutes a self? Hume appeals to the principles of association. The many thoughts and perceptions are related to each other by resemblance. Example, a memory resembles the original perception of which, is, which it is a memory 
and causation. Impressions cause corresponding ideas, experiences cause memories, beliefs cause other beliefs and so on. This provides a further explanation of how we have confused similarity for identity. It is because of these many links of causation and resemblance that we think of the self as an identity. The imagination replaces our experience of them with an fictitious idea of something continuous and uninterrupted. Hume's theory suggests a strange result. Intuitively, we think that I might have had a quite different set of experiences from the set I have had. But if I just am a set of experiences, this is not true. Hume could respond that this is a matter of degree. Because the self has many experiences, if just some of these were different, that would not be enough to make for a different self. So, I can still be the same person even if some of my experiences were different. But I wouldn't be the same person is a great deal of my thoughts and experiences, beliefs, desires, emotions, etc. were different. But this then leads to an even stranger result. Many of your thoughts and experiences are related both casually and by resemblance to mine. For example, I say what I think, you then think what I was thinking. Are you now partly me? It does not seem quite right just to say that the only difference between two selves is the sheer number of these relations between mental states. Instead, we might want to say that some relations of cause and resemblance constitutive of personal identity and not others. But Hume can't say this. We can't say that the relevant types of relations of causation and resemblance link together the mental states of the same person but not the mental states of different people because this presupposes the idea of the same person. But that is just the idea that we are trying to analyze. So where did the idea came from? Imagination. Hume has an imagistic theory of thought. He thinks that thought uses images derived from impressions. He therefore thinks of the imagination as working with images, but this covers all thought. What makes the imagination important for Hume is that it connects up ideas according to the principle of association. When the mind passes from the idea or impression of one object to the idea or belief of another, it is not determined by reason, but by certain principles which associate together the ideas of these objects and unite them in the imagination. All three principles involve a movement to an idea for which the impression is not usually present to the senses. When your mind moves from looking at a picture to thinking of the person in the picture, that person is not present, so you have an idea in mind of something not present to the senses. Again, when you move around a house and your mind anticipates what is around the corner, this is not yet something you can see. And when you experience some event and infer its cause, the cause itself is not something you are experiencing. And so, the imagination plays a crucial role in Hume's philosophy. The function of the imagination is not just imaginative creating scenarios and ideas which are not real. The imagination is the foundation of everything that is believed real as well. So, how do we distinguish between what we imagine and what we think is real? Belief Hume raises and answers the question of how we distinguish between fiction and belief. His claim is that a belief is an idea that is particularly forceful and vivid. Belief is nothing but a more vivid, lively, forcible, firm, steady conception of an object than what the imagination alone is ever able to attain. The same quality that distinguished impressions from ideas also distinguishes beliefs from ideas of memory and imagination. We can imagine whatever we want, but we cannot believe whatever we want. Forming a belief is not under our control. Hume's account of belief in terms of vivacity explains this. Suppose I have an impression of the senses. My mind is immediately led to form the correlative idea, the copy, because of the close and immediate connection to current impression. The idea gains much of the vivacity of the impression 
and so I have a particularly forceful and lively idea, a belief. But when I imagine seeing something, my idea does not rely on an impression, so it cannot have the same vivacity. The general principle here is that vivacity is transmitted from one perception to another by the principle of association. A copy of an impression both resembles the impression and is caused by it. When I look at a photo, I form an idea of the photo and then an idea of the person in the photo. I believe the person whose photo it is exists as a cause of the photo. The vivacity of the impression of the photo is transmitted to the idea of the person. So I believe the person exists. Or again, if I see a billiard ball strike another, I can imagine that the first ball will simply stop dead upon contact. But this does not have the same vivacity as my belief that second ball will move away. This is because my belief is the effect of past impressions while the imagined alternative is not. The role of cause effect. Where the relation of regularity between one perception and the next is cause effect, vivacity can be transmitted so as to form beliefs. This is not so with resemblance and contiguity because they link a perception to many different perceptions which means that the vivacity is dissipated, each connected perception only getting a small share of the original vivacity. But cause effect connects a perception to just one other, that is the idea of the cause or effect of what is being thought about or experienced. And so that one perception receives all the vivacity of the first. Is this right? Do we never form beliefs on the basis of just resemblance and contiguity? Again, my thoughts turn from the photo to the person, that is resemblance, and form a belief. When I am near home, I think of it, that is contiguity, and form a belief. But not that from the photo, I do not form the belief that the person is present, as the photo is present, from being close to home. I do not form the belief that home is here, because it is near to here. Rather. I believe that the person and home exist, that they are real, not fictitious, as objects standing in relations of resemblance and contiguity to my thoughts. But these beliefs about what is real are not formed by resemblance or contiguity alone. They depend on cause effect. Our thoughts would not move from the photo to the person or from being near to home to home itself. Hume argues, unless we already have the beliefs that the person and home exist. And these beliefs were formed by cause effect, the ideas of the friend and home being caused by the relevant impressions or by ideas that are related as cause or effect to ideas caused by impressions. Vivacity, belief and reason. Hume's theory of vivacity is highly problematic and no longer taken seriously. He is trying to place on the single scale of vivacity all the differences between impressions, memories, ideas and beliefs. At one end, impressions then beliefs, memories, imagination and other ideas. Is this scale even correct? Don't some daydreams have more vivacity than memories or abstract beliefs? Or do beliefs and memories have similar amounts of vivacity? But how do we draw these boundaries? Hume can't say. Is it right to say that a memory could be turned into a belief or even an impression by a further increase in vivacity? Surely not. Memories and impressions are logically different kinds of mental state from belief. For example, a belief about the future cannot become a memory of the future with an increase in vivacity. Nor can a belief become an impression because an impression is given immediately by a particular sensory modality. The idea of vivacity is linked to energy and force, yet we have no clear conception of a distinct mental energy. Is vivacity linked to neurophysiological energy? We have no evidence to suggest so. We must reject the theory as at best metaphorical. Hume's claim that beliefs, unlike fictions of the imaginations, relate to impressions and cause effect also faces an objection. We normally take our beliefs to be a cognitive response to evidence. If the evidence gives our good reasons for a particular belief, we form that belief. 
Hume rejects this as we saw in the cot above. When the mind passes from the idea or impression of one object to the idea or belief of another, it is not determined by reason, but by the principles of association. His theory has the consequence that we do not form beliefs on the basis of the reasons that justify them. Coming to have a belief is not a rational process. Part of Hume's argument is that the formation of belief cannot be controlled by the will. This seems right, we cannot believe at will, but it does not follow as Hume thinks that beliefs are merely caused by non-rational factors that is vivacity. What is missing is the idea of judgment, weighing up whether the evidence provides sufficient reason to believe. This process is not directly under the control of the will and it is rationally directed. The association of ideas. There is a connection between different thoughts or ideas of the mind and their appearance in memory or imagination. Even in fleeting thoughts and loose conversation, their connections can be observed. This is the case whatever language is used. Different ideas are connected. There are three principles of connection among ideas. Resemblance, contiguity that is relationship in time or place and cause and effect. This can be illustrated by a picture leading our thoughts to the original that is resemblance by one room in a building leading us to a discourse concerning the others that is contiguity and by the looking at a wound leading our thoughts to the pain which followed it that is cause and effect. On examination, we may become assured that these three form the complete list of connections. Mathematical sciences have this advantage above the moral sciences. The ideas of the former are clear and determinate even to the smallest distinction. An oval is clearly distinct from a circle, but virtue and vice, right and wrong are not clearly distinct from each other. Geometric terms are clearly defined, moral ones are not and introduce ambiguity into our reasoning. Objects that are but similar are assumed to be identical. Such terms as power, force, energy and necessary connection are obscure and uncertain and their impressions are difficult to examine. And they point towards effects while solidity, extension and motion are qualities in themselves. Without extreme care, Moral ideas fall into obscurity and confusion. Further, a Euclidean proposition can be lengthy and involved while moral reasoning is expected to have few parts. When we move the organs of our body or direct the faculties of our mind, we are conscious of internal power. This idea is an idea of reflection. We are conscious of our will commanding our motion, but the means of this operation the energy behind it is far from our immediate consciousness and escapes our enquiry because first energy concerns the mysterious spiritual substance with influence over a material one. If we should wish to move a mountain or control planets, the activity would not be any more beyond our comprehension. Second, Energy concerns the various with remarkable differences, that is, the will can influence the tongue and fingers, but not the heart or liver, and experience can teach us about the influence of our will, but not explain the secret connection which binds one event with another. Third, energy cannot be explained by anatomy, which instead can show only that it is not the member that is moved, but certain muscles and nerves. Our conclusion is that, our idea of power is not a copy of any consciousness of power within us, but is unknown and inconceivable. We learn by experience the frequent conjunction of objects, not anything like a connection between them. Many philosophers believe that here they can use the reason to acknowledge mind to be both the ultimate and immediate sole cause of every event and that every cause is but a volition of the supreme being whose will is behind every effect. A billiard ball is not moved by a force derived from the order of nature, but it is the deity himself who wills the movement or that our mind's ideas are but revelations made to us by our maker. But such words do not erase their ignorance of that power. 
but if everything is full of God, then nature and all creations are robbed of power. And the argument has taken us to a fairy land. We can have no idea of the supreme being or of power except from what we learn from reflection on our own faculties. If our ignorance were a good reason for rejecting anything, it would be the rejection of the principle of all energy being in the supreme being. For we know as little about the one, that is our ignorance, as we do the other. Let us summarize what we have discussed so far. According to David Hume, a belief is an idea that has a greater vivacity than the imagination can achieve. The source of this vivacity depends on two things, at some point being derived from impressions and not just by any principle of association, but by cause effect. A belief may itself be caused by impressions or it may the idea of a cause or effect of what we have experienced. Resemblance and contiguity can add to the vivacity of a belief, but cannot create a belief out of an idea or thereon. Whether or not his account of vivacity is right, this relation of belief to impressions and the role of cause effect deserves serious consideration and illustrates Hume's empiricism. Now you can try to answer the questions given here. First one, explain the principle of cause and effect. Second one, describe the imagistic theory of thought by David Hume. Third one, how do we distinguish between fiction and belief according to David Hume? Fourth one, give an Hume's account of belief in terms of vivacity. How does the mind work according to Hume? What is self according to Hume? What are the three types of regularity that hold between perceptions? Hope that you may go through the reference books for further reading. Starting with Hume, written by Morris W. E. and C. Brown in 2012, published by Continuum in London. Hume's Philosophy of Common Life, written by D. W. Livingston in 1984, published by University of Chicago Press in Chicago. The Life of David Hume, written by E. C. Mosner, published by Nelson in 1954. Hume on Knowledge, written by H. W. Noonan, published by Rutledge in 1999. The Blackwell Guide to Hume's Triatis, written by S. Traeger, published by Oxford. David Hume, Critical Assessment, Six Volumes, written by S. Twayman, published by Rutledge in 1995. Hume's Theory of Consciousness, written by W. Waxman, published by Cambridge University Press. Thank you for watching this program. We can meet again with another topic. Have a nice day.